Welcome to CC Licenses and Combating Disinformation Campaigns, everyone. This is our final webinar in our Ground Truth and Open Internet series. My name is Jenna Wetzler, and I'm the Director of Learning and Training at Creative Commons. Our mission is about making a better global shared information commons. Our work helps create and increase equitable sharing of knowledge and culture in the public interest. We're working with journalists now because first, right now represents a particularly challenging time for journalism. According to our research, journalists face interrelated existential challenges from misinformation and disinformation campaigns, the proliferation of online abuse, loss of trust in journalism, and the increasing difficulty of making a living from journalism. Yet, journalism is essential to a healthy information ecosystem. It's essential to democracy. And the right to receive and impart information is literally in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we believe that open internet efforts can help journalists work to provide verified information, investigate our shared challenges, and bring essential facts to all of us. In particular, CC's open licenses and legal tools can help free the flow of critical information to empower journalists and citizens around the world. You can find more information about our, our program, our webinar recordings, and our research on our Open Journalism Project page on the Creative Commons website. There, we hope you'll also register for our free online training targeting copyright basics for journalists, where and how to find open, legal, freely usable media for stories, and practical tools for open licensing on March 23rd. Finally, we'll be sharing research we've conducted with over 500 journalists from 18 countries later this month on the website as well. So today's discussion is meant to build on the momentum of previous discussions, but we'll speak a little bit more about CC licenses than we have in the past. Our speakers will highlight additional working models for information sharing, drawing from the ideals of an open internet, using open source platforms, applying crowdsourcing techniques, and using our CC licenses to ensure the biggest possible audiences can access critical information. Please join me in welcoming Shalini Joshi and Joel Abrams. So it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Joshi first. Shalini Joshi is a program director for training and network at Medan, a technology nonprofit that builds software and initiatives to strengthen global journalism, digital literacy, and accessibility for information for the world. As a regional lead, Shalini is involved in expanding Medan's work and its global network in the Asia Pacific region. Shalini provides support to fact checkers, newsrooms, and academics involved in and addressing and researching misinformation. Shalini is also the co-founder of Kabar Laharia, India's only independent digital news network available to viewers in remote rural areas and small towns. She has been a Truth Buzz Fellow with the International Center for Journalists and the fellowship focused on designing creative ways to counter misinformation. Shalini, thank you so much for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you, Jenrin. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's, it's really um, an honor to be part of a Creative Commons uh, webinar. And, um, and I hope I can share some insights from the work that I'm doing at Midan and also the work that I've done previously when I was part of Kabbalaria. Um, so do you want me to go ahead now or, or do you want to in also introduce Joel and, and then I can... Um, Please, help. yeah, go ahead and I'll introduce Joel right after yours, your presentation. Okay, okay, great, okay. Um, so I have a few slides and I'm going to try and share my screen to talk more and show you some examples of the work that we're doing. Um, Please let me know if you're able to see my screen. We can. Okay. Um, okay, great. Um, so I work with Midan and um, Midan is a global uh, technology nonprofit as Jen Rin introduced uh, the organization. Um, the organization was founded in 2006 and we have a vision of a more equitable internet. Um, we work with partners in emerging economies. Um, so we work in the Asia Pacific region where I'm based. Uh, we work in Latin America, um, in North Africa and Western Asia, uh, in e East Africa, and also in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we have a distributed team uh, with team members present in all these regions. 
um, and also in other regions um, in the global north. Um, um, Check, which is a software, um, is uh, an open source software which supports um, a lot of different programs across the regions that I just talked about. Uh, we support pro projects on uh, journalism, um, on verification and fact checking. Uh, a lot of election monitoring programs are being supported by CHEC. Um, and also uh, a lot of um, uh, people who are working on open source investigations, um, on, on monitoring human rights issues, on looking at issues of hate speech and dangerous content online, um, are also using CHEC um, in order to annotate content, archive content, um, and address misinformation and disinformation. Um, this is the work that Midan has done from the time we started uh, until now. Um, and, and the uh, range of issues that Midan has worked on uh, includes um, election monitoring programs such as Verificado in Mexico, um, election land um, in the United States, um, to more recently, uh, Facts First PH, which is a fact-checking um, collaborative initiative in the Philippines. Um, we also have uh, partners who are operating uh, tip lines. These are services that are available to users of WhatsApp uh, and other messaging platforms such as Facebook Messenger, Viber, etc., where users of these platforms can send in uh, tips or claims to fact-checking groups uh, who are using CHEC, our software, and fact-checking groups can then respond to those users uh, using the technology and, and responding uh, in very little time. Um, so the range of work that we've done um, in the last um, 15 plus years uh, is varied and, um, and currently we are also focusing on um, addressing health-related misinformation, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, I'm going to focus on three things today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the checklist, uh, which is a weekly newsletter that Midan produces. I'm also going to talk about Health Desk, which is a resource that is available uh, to journalists and fact checkers who are addressing health-related issues, especially health misinformation. And I'll talk briefly about Kabaleria, the newsroom that I co-founded um, in 2002 in India. So starting with the checklist. Um, the checklist is um, a weekly newsletter. It focuses on regions um, that are usually overlooked. So uh, emerging economies and regions that I talked about earlier, uh, which include Asia Pacific, Latin America, um, North Africa, Western Asia, um, East Africa, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the way in which the checklist uh, is produced is that we have team members in these regions who contribute to the checklist by sharing regional highlights from um, each of their regions every week. Um, the newsletter focuses on significant developments that impact the quality of online information. So developments related to the spread of uh, misinformation and disinformation and looking at how communities are impacted by this. Um, there is a focus on uh, vulnerable communities, communities that are targeted very often um, by people who spread uh, falsehood. And um, so we try and cover issues related to the role of technology platforms um, in either addressing misinformation or in ways that they are, uh, they might be overlooking um, the spread of misinformation on platforms. Um, if there are significant changes in laws and policies of countries uh, related to misinformation and disinformation, we try and capture those events and issues as well. Uh, research reports that are significant and relevant to checklist uh, audience, um, uh, we, we try and include insights from uh, those research reports. Um, and um, 
the checklist is also um, a platform where we can showcase innovative efforts. Um, so efforts being made by um, newsrooms, independent fact-checking groups, civil society groups um, to combat disinformation. Uh, those are also showcased very often in um, issues of the checklist. Um, so um, the checklist in a way is also helping us uh, in building community. Um, and um, some of the organizational values of Midan um, are also reflected in the checklist. So for example, I already talked about uh, the selection of content which is from different regions. And so thinking globally um, is something that uh, we focus a lot uh, as part of our work in Midan. Um, many of our partners are based in the global south, uh, many of our team members as well. Um, and the content that we include in the checklist is also um, reflective of this um, reality. Um, then in terms of uh, building a community of uh, subscribers who um, share feedback um, on the design and content of the checklist, who contribute insights, sometimes um, uh, even um, their showcase, uh, help us in showcasing their own work through the checklist. Um, and we try and um, um, strengthen this community by providing information to the subscribers and um, not spamming them with uh, emails that are irrelevant or requests um, uh, too often. Um, we also work in collaboration. Um, so either with our partners or sometimes with subscribers, um, there are special issues of the checklist around um, significant events. So for example, next week around um, International Women's Day, uh, there's going to be a special issue where again, uh, we are working in collaboration with some of our partners who are focusing on women's issues. Um, and we have interviews and quotes and contributions from these partners. Um, in the past, we have worked on special issues around elections in different regions. Uh, in 2020, we had one on um, elections in Myanmar, um, where we looked at the political developments uh, taking place and um, commented on that, had contributions from people there as well. Um, Open source investigations um, are again uh, something that we include in um, uh, the checklist uh, and uh, groups uh, and communities that are focusing on OSINT, um, we try and include their work uh, in the newsletter. Um, of course, uh, content that is uh, paywalled, uh, uh, we, we avoid using that content. Uh, in the che checklist because we feel that all um, subscribers should be able to access uh, all the articles that are available in the each issue of the newsletter. And uh, we also provide an informed opinion um, on uh, each article that is being shared. So that's the checklist. Uh, if you visit the Midan website, that's midan.com, you'll be able to see um, the issues of checklist. Uh, we used to host the checklist on MailChimp and recently migrated to Substack, uh, but all the issues of the checklist are available on the website. Um, the next uh, resource that Midan offers that I'm going to talk about is Health Desk. Um, Health Desk, um, as the name itself suggests, uh, is a resource uh, focusing on health issues, particularly on COVID-19, um, because in the last year and a half or two years, um, ever since the pandemic hit us, we've seen a lot of misinformation around COVID um, and uh, related issues. Um, so Health Desk um, was launched in order to provide support to fact checkers and journalists, uh, because many of our partners who are either fact checkers or journalists also said that um, overnight they all had to work as health journalists because there was so much on health and so much uh, misinformation on COVID that they had to address. 
um, and very often accessing experts or medical information um, or scientific research uh, was becoming very challenging um, for these people. And so Health Desk is um, um, a resource where we have a team of public health experts, um, scientists, epidemiologists, um, who are working with the Midan team to address questions and queries that are sent to us um, by fact checkers and journalists from different regions. Um, the content that, that comes to the health desk and the content that is available on the health desk is something that comes directly from our partnerships. Uh, so people send in questions to us. Uh, very often, um, they're working on very tight deadlines. Um, and we try and, and address those questions and provide uh, information and resources in a language that is accessible, in a language that uh, sometimes it's also um, a language that um, the fact checkers might prefer uh, and not just in English. And uh, the team that produces Health Desk uh, makes every effort uh, to provide the most recent, the most scientific information. Um, given that it is uh, COVID-19 that we're looking at and very often um, information or research uh, changes um, as there's more and more research being done around uh, the pandemic and the virus. We also try and update um, uh, people who are accessing the health desk um, on um, uh, any kind of um, 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 recent uh, information or research uh, that is available. Um, so the health desk is also hosted on Midan's website, um, and uh, uh, please feel free to take a look at that. And if you have questions related to health or COVID-19, uh, please uh, feel free to also ask those questions, especially if you're a journalist or a fact checker um, or somebody in interested in knowing more about uh, these issues. Um, I'll quickly talk uh, about Khabar Lehria. Uh, I don't have a slide on that, uh, but um, Khabar Lehria means uh, news waves. Um, it's a newsroom that um, was co-founded in 2002 in India. Um, I'm one of the co-founders and the newsroom completes 20 years uh, this year. So very proud of um, the work that has been done. Um, it's um, um, the only newsroom in India that has a team of rural women that are working as journalists. Um, these are women from rural areas, women from some of the most marginalized communities um, in North India, uh, women who have been trained to work as journalists. Um, so they're they all women in different positions. Uh, reporters, editors, social media managers. Um, <clears throat> out, they're also doing outreach. Um, they're also uh, producing a lot of content um, um, for viewers online. Uh, we started as a newspaper in 2002. In 2015-16, um, when the media and the digital landscape was changing uh, in India and also in many other places, um, we discontinued the newspaper but went digital at that point. Um, the number of people who were accessing news um, produced by Kabbal area also increased. Uh, we started with a group of six women who were producing uh, the news. Now it's a team of 40 plus women. Um, um, working in different roles and capacities, um, and a viewership of uh, over 1.5 million um, on different platforms. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about Kabbalaria and its current work later uh, in the Q&A. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, and congratulations on your 20-year anniversary. We're also going through a 20-year anniversary at Creative Commons, and that's, that's no small feat. I also um, understand that there's a, a documentary that is coming out about Kabbalaria um, and it has been nominated for an Oscar. So congrats on the NGO that you co-founded. 
having the story really get out there. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'd now like to introduce Joel Abrams. Joel, thank you so much for joining us. Joel is the Director of Digital Strategy and Outreach at The Conversation US, where he's helped triple the readership over the last three years. The Conversation US is a part of a nonprofit network of 18, I'm sorry, of eight international news sites publishing hundreds of useful articles of news and analysis each week, all written by academic experts in four languages and available under the Creative Commons CC BY ND license. He's previously worked in product management and online editorial positions at the Boston Globe, the Christian Science Monitor, and Lycos. He started his career as a writer and producer at CNN International. Joel, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'm very glad to uh, be part of this and um, have the conversation really do view Creative Commons licensing as a critical part of our work. So glad to do it. Um, so to, uh, to start off with, in case anyone's familiar, what are we? We're a nonprofit independent news organization dedicated to unlocking the knowledge of experts for the public good. Um, and, you know, when Shalini talked a few minutes ago about how, you know, journalists around the world suddenly had to become health experts, well, there were, there are already many people who've been out there who've been studying for these sub subjects for years, decades, and, but they are often not communicating with the public. So there's a lot of very important knowledge locked up in their heads and sometimes journalists have the time and expertise to be able to successfully get that knowledge from the experts, but often they don't. So we're really working on the supply side of quality information to with this collaboration between journalists and academics to make good quality journalism available to, for all under a CC UI and the license. Um, the map shows where all our editors are. We're, why, why we do it? So there are a bunch of problems that we're trying to address. One is, of course, like um, the pandemic and elections in various countries have shown that there is a real need for people getting good information, for good information to get out there to counter misinformation and disinformation. And all too often, the media amplifies the loudest, often people with agendas who are not the ones who know things. On the other hand, there are these experts who have the knowledge and it's locked up in their heads, locked up in academic journals. And if anyone has tried to read the average academic journal, that's not really making it available to the public. Um, as I mentioned, journalists rarely have time to, to become expert in fields. And frankly, clickbait, Things that uh, they they heard, you know, write an article about a tweet that that's cheaper and gets as much audience or even more than a bit of quality information. So if a, if a news organization that's already struggling for to stay afloat has a choice between having a reporter spend hours and hours understanding and a difficult but important issue or you know not. <laughs> Sadly, we know how that is going. So, so we, we try in our small way to address these problems with what we do. Um, so conversation has, uh, as uh, Jen mentioned, we're around the world. We publish in four different languages, including Bahasa. Um, and, but through, through, you know, Creative Commons and, and, and just getting our content out there, we've been we published in at least 97 countries, 37 languages. I mean, it, we, we're trying our, our best to get this information available to, to people around the world. So um, we, we have, you know, published a huge amount of stuff during this pandemic on, on, on health issues. This is some screenshots of an article that was published in various places from Conversation Africa, Conversation Canada also did it, but the distinctive thing about what we do is that every article is written by an academic expert, someone who is qualified to talk about it, not, not because they have a loud voice, not because they have a platform, but we're trying to give a platform to the people who know things. 
Um, we've had people who've been studying issues for decades and as well because we're talking to people who know things like we had articles on coronavirus like five years ago explaining what it was and we had had articles years ago talking about like the dangers of of zoonotic infections although i think we try to avoid that word because we try to use words that people know so how do we go about doing it it's a it, we try we go through a very extensive process to to do it but first uh an editor will say, okay, the public needs some, we need to do some more articles explaining, fighting misinformation on vaccines or, or explaining how electoral fraud does and doesn't happen in, in, in the US and, and or you know, many other topics explaining the context of the war in Ukraine and NATO. And today we have an article helping Americans understand who will fail our roots because that's suddenly in the news. And, Many Americans have not been familiar with this. Anyway, so then the editors find an expert, make sure that he knows about it, and commission them to write their article. The author makes a draft, the editor edits it, the author revises, the editor edits the fact check, the author revises, and can go back and forth many times between the editor. But then we have a second editor look it over, make sure that it's successful in public, that it's not missing anything, and there are more revisions. Um, and then for publication, there's one last review to, by as one of our senior people just to make sure that okay, is there anything that got left out or that needs to be there or that maybe doesn't need to be there? Copy editor go over it, and then finally, the last thing is that the author approves the final version because we want to be sure that what we're publishing really reflects their knowledge and their expertise. That, that an editor hasn't introduced misunderstanding or political agenda, just that this is what the author has to bring to the public. Um, publish it on conversation.com and then it's republished um, under a Creative Commons license by anyone who wants to around the world from, you know, big media outlets like CNN and Washington Post and BBC to the, what, what is even, what we think is even more impactful is, you know, small outlets around the world, small town newspapers, new online startups, um, uh, hundreds of people have we published us. And I'll add the asterisk here that uh, I'm most familiar with how we do things in the Conversation US, the other um, editions, we all operate pretty much autonomously, although we share interesting articles, but, um, other processes are a little different. So how do you, if you're interested in republishing, we try to make it as easy as possible, but there's a button republish this article that appears on a larger computer. We figure people don't want to be cutting and pasting on their phones. Um, you click it and you get some HTML code that you can paste right into your publishing system. Um, usually requires some little tweaking, moving the headline around and Sometimes photos need reformatting, but and then that that's really it. Um, no agreement is necessary. It's just there under Creative Commons. Um, the uh, and there, if you want more information, I think uh, Kat has put the link in the chat. But you can also uh, just go to our publishing guidelines that are in the footer. Um, Jen and said that some people would be interested in our funding model, which I think is quite unique. We have sort of three um, revenue sources, um, which vary by country. Um, membership is universities, which pay us at a fee to help uh, them publicize their research, because a lot of them do feel like they need to get, I mean, they're, they're, they're paying for this knowledge to get into their, their professor's head and their heads, and they're hiring good people and doing new research, and they want to help the public understand that and value the role of higher education. Um, we also are funded by various foundations and individual donations, and it varies by region of the world. Like Indonesia is almost where where the university sector is not as prosperous, is uh, funded mainly by foundations. Um, the UK and Spain are funded mainly by universities. The US has about a, a split of 45 percent universities 45 percent foundations and a growing amount of now up to 10 percent from donations um, in australia almost 30 percent of their revenue is now from individual donations um 
And, and we're, we're glad to see that, that there clearly is a, a growing audience for the, uh, for this quality information and, and glad to see it is about 40, 40 to 50% carries by month of our traffic is through republication. So by, with the Creative Commons location, we're, we're doubling our, our reach. Um, and that proportion has gone down recently. Google has been sending us a lot more traffic, which we hope is Google trying to value better information. Um, hard to say, of course, it's Google. Um, but uh, that, that's uh, hopefully that answered some questions about it. If you want more information, you can email either specifically the US team, including me at um, U.S. republish this conversation or the global team, which is also me and a couple of other people at Global Republish. Um, and um, of course, if you have questions, please uh, answer them in the upcoming discussion. Thank you so much. I imagine that um, universities that have memberships with you have professors with much higher citation counts for some of their work than maybe through traditional means um, since they're not kind of stuck behind paywalls so that it's so interesting to see i really appreciate your both of your presentations so now we actually have time for q a with the audience i want to um, let everybody know here you are welcome to type your questions in the chat space or unmute your microphones and, and ask them live and to kick off conversation i might just ask the first question if that's all right so uh, both of your projects or multiple projects address misinformation or disinformation efforts online. Are there ways you see the impact of your efforts demonstrated? Maybe I'll um, field this to uh, Shalini first and then to Joel. Um, yes, um, one can see the impact of um, some of the projects in different ways. Um, I think um, very often we've heard from some of our partners who are using um, the technology, our open source um, platform check, um, that um, having access to verified and credible information is really important um, to users of messaging platforms. And sometimes when they are able to share a fact check, um, they receive responses immediately from users, thanking them um, for providing that information. Um, one of our partners even said that um, one WhatsApp user wrote back immediately to them uh, to say that I was in the middle of an argument and I needed uh, credible and verified information immediately. And thank you for sending me that. So, so there's that level of impact. Uh, but I think um, um, misinformation is such a huge problem and very often around large events like the pandemic, like elections, we've seen um, journalists and fact checkers being hit by a storm of misinformation. Um, and um, being able to address some of that and in that context also being able to provide verified information I think creates a huge uh, kind of impact um, and, and in a very positive way uh, for people who are accessing that information because there's uh, this dearth of verified information in such contexts. So yeah. Thank you so much. Just to jump in for one second, one of the things that came up in our research was how um, the, the spread of misinformation on WhatsApp in particular is really hard to address because they're closed channels. And it sounds like your work can address that. It sounds like it's made a kind of inroads to what are traditionally kind of closed channels. So that's that's pretty impressive. Thank you. And over to you, Joel. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, <laughs> I mean, I, I do sometimes get a little pessimistic about the impact we're having, but we're clearly we're being read in a lot of places. And we know that um, in addition to um, the readership that we can measure and online, we also 
see the articles republished in, in newspapers, and we see 60% of our authors say they're contacted by other media organizations. So I think, you know, I mean, I think when all there is out there is misinformation, the misinformation is clearly going to 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 triumph. So if we get more good quality information out there, there's at least the truth has a fighting chance. Um, and and so we see see it getting out there. And one of the things, one of the sort of other impacts that we see is that the the people who write for us get interviewed by other media organizations. So they, they learn they learn that engaging with the public and offering their knowledge is is can be rewarding and can have an impact. And so they do more of it. And they and we've had and the editors have helped them like develop a language so that they can understand more about okay, what what about their work is important and interesting to the public. I love that. So in my mind you uh the conversation unlocks the expertise often you know locked behind the ivory tower um so you're both finding inroads in um into news sharing that i think are are new and i'm so glad that you both could join us today <laughs> um all right we have a, a question from the audience um this is a cautionary question not a negative remark um, in the lifestyle of a story process, isn't there the danger of too many layers of control that might unintentionally interfere with the independence of journalism, and also might have the potential of this lengthy process being gained to cause uh, to maintain an overall storyline by editorial by the editorial process? So, are there are there challenges to the the lengthy editorial process? Yes, there are. Um, I, but I, I think there there is a difference between you know, a, a report, a, 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 re, a process with a traditional reporter and their editor, and the the people we are dealing with who are who they're they're non reporters, they're 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 professors and researchers. Um, so they they know what they want to say. And they, 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 uh, but they don't really know how to say it in the way. So, so they do require more, more editorial attention to help them understand. You know, this is the public just isn't going to understand this. And can you provide a a link to an to another article? that will help the public understand this point that you're making here. Um, yes, it, it does involve, it does promote some um, more us, us having a larger role in it, but the, I mean, if anyone has tried to read an academic journal, many of them are just impenetrable. And that is how, especially in the US, that is the road to success in academia is often use as much jargon and make it sound as complicated as possible instead of making it as clear as possible. So we need to like build up new muscles in the in these people. And, and that isn't all of them. Some, some people have, uh, have uh, some some people come to us and they write something that's clear and understandable and brief and that requires very little editorial intervention but others require not we have uh, we actually have built into our cms there's a readability gauge which is set at an 11th grade level and it runs on a 0 to 100 scale and um, articles come in that are that get like a 12 on this 100 point readability scale and, and and editors do their best to get it up to to eighty or ninety, and, and usually usually succeed, not always, um, but but it really is, you know, it, it's a sort of structural challenge that we're trying to overcome of helping the unlock this knowledge, which is there and it's great and it's really valuable to the public, but it, it the conversation really strives to be that bridge between the the expert knowledge and the public and to provide the platform that the public can understand what is there and, and why it's important and help them understand the 
the news that they're seeing elsewhere. That's so inspiring. Yeah, I, I really like that there can be, not that it's it's easy, but um, there are structural challenges within academia and within journalism. And you found a, um, a solution to one that kind of bridges both both fields. So that's that's pretty impressive. Um, all right, I will ask the next question. Um, both Medan and the conversation deliberately apply CC licenses to information you provide. And I imagine some journalists might question sharing content more flexibly like this. How do you explain why you're sharing information this way to other journalists, especially those who are skeptical? Uh, Joel, do you want to go first? Please, you, you go, Shami, if you'd like to. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, you, you're welcome to, to take that first. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, I think um, the the objective of uh, Midan is to provide information um, to people, information that's relevant, uh, that's topical, that's verified, um, information that's not paywalled. Um, we haven't actually come across this kind of question from uh, journalists or um, people who've accessed our information, but just in terms of information that we put out, uh, we make our uh, policy very clear uh, that information is available for people to use in the work that they're doing, um, to maybe even republish, um, to use um, during um, training workshops um, or, uh, you know, for, for uh, their own context. Um, people have also written to us to ask for permission to use information that's available, especially information um, on the health desk. Um, and uh, from small newsrooms um, in countries like the Philippines, to uh, global newsrooms uh, that are also trying to address issues related to the pandemic. Um, a whole number of newsrooms and journalists have accessed our information uh, and have attributed the team uh, and done for the information uh, that they have uh, um, used. So, so I think it, it meets the objectives of the organization, which is to provide information, which is verified and uh, relevant and um, topical. Thank you. And I, I should have jumped in to, to say for anybody who's not familiar with Creative Commons licenses, they are a legal tool that works with copyright. So where copyright is all rights reserved for the creator or copyright owner, Creative Commons licenses are considered some rights reserved. So the creators have a way to determine what they want to share what permissions they want to grant downstream users, readers of their, their articles and so on, and grant them legally. All right, and um, Joel, over to you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think with the conversation, we use the Creative Commons license for, for two reasons. One is that um, it, it just it enables a much greater reach for the information. Um, and the other is that it's unfortunately quality is expensive and people are unwilling to pay for it. And, as, and globally, there's a huge search for models of journalism that work, um, that can pay for themselves. And sadly, there are a few places that can support um, doing in-depth expert journalism. So we, that's why we've turned to philanthropy to support this as an NGO. Um, we have been lucky enough and, and sad enough to, to get, get support for this, but then that allows us to, to give it away for free because people, we would not be able to make enough with people, with asking people to pay for it or having ads to support it or subscriptions. Um, that's, I used to joke that I was in plenty of non-profitable 
journalism before I moved to nonprofit journalism. And, and it's a much better model for this sort of thing where we're trying to um, where we're trying to spread knowledge as widely as possible. I'll add that sometimes I hear from journalists that they're they're concerned about sort of the flip side of, oh, well, this information is everywhere. We can't have it exclusively if it's being licensed under Creative Commons. And my answer to those people is that, that for the most part, um, readers associate the publication with the information they're reading there. And if there's a, and there's just such a flood, a sea of content flowing by every day, and they only read a few things. And if they read an article from the conversation in a particular news outlet, and it's worthwhile and gives some good information, then that goes to the credit of the organization that has republished us. It, the, uh, the reader isn't thinking when they see this headline, oh, this was also available on the conversation.com and on this other news site and this other news site. They just see, oh, well, it's in the headlines I'm getting from this publication that I read and trust. And so they, they, they read it and they hopefully learn from it. And I mean, the the authors still get credit, even if it's repurposed and, and republished. So, um, right, because it is the we use the attribution, no derivatives flavor of Creative Commons, which also it helps. You know, one of the things that our 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 academic authors are concerned about is that their words might be taken out of context or like or or changed that, that some journalist somewhere is going to change them. But that no derivatives license protects them that that changes can't be made without their approval so that that's an important right that is reserved thank you for sharing that um we have a, a question from the audience i'm realizing um we probably have time for one more question after this one um if we're depending on on how long the um, responses take so let's see the question is does part of the does the part related to some rights reserved in Creative Commons have a similar long, um, the similar long years of rights as in the case of traditional rights that the copyright law confers by default? Um, is there any reform related to the length of time in CC? So Creative Commons licenses work with copyright. They exist. The copyright permissions that Creative Commons affords last as long as the copyright lasts. So for example, um, in the US, um, copyright lasts the length of the author, um, the author's life, plus an additional 70 years. That is the length of time that the Creative Commons license that the author would apply to their work would last. So when copyright expires, so do the, the permissions or restrictions of Creative Commons licenses. It's a great question. So uh, yeah, I guess, I don't know if I need to field that one to, <laughs> to you. Um, that was something I never thought about before, but yeah, so I guess after, and thanks. And, but, but I think with the Creative Commons license, that at least with the journalism we do, like there isn't anything that you would legitimately want to do with the article that you couldn't do in terms of republishing, but we also, we do have people who say, well, I want to use an excerpt for, in a book or an excerpt in an online test. And we say, well, we, we can't do that under the license, but here ask the author for, for permission and the authors are, are almost always, sure, we'd love that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. A lot of times we forget that this can be a communication. It can be a conversation, a conversation with, authors about their work. So you can always reach back to the author and, and ask for the permission that, that you want to, to use their work, regardless of the, the copyright or Creative Commons license applied. Um, let's see, and the follow-up is the idea was to suggest to Creative Commons that they could initi initiate copyright reform, inspire copyright reform by giving an option to those seeking a Creative Commons license to limit the length of time um, to a reasonable time. Um, yeah, interesting. So we have, we are engaged in copyright reform or just copyright conversations around the world. Um, I know there are ways that you can CC license your work and then 
when you want to change the permissions that you're affording, you can add a, an additional Creative Commons license. We don't normally recommend that because it can get confusing to downstream users when you have one, you know, one version of your publication under a particular Creative Commons license and then an updated license applied to the, the same work somewhere else. But that is possible and that can allow um, creators the right to to afford their work more freely than their initial license allowed. So there are there are the flexibilities I think we we might be looking for in Creative Commons licenses. You can also use public domain tools to eliminate the copyright permissions attached to a, a given work. So when you dedicate your work to the public domain, it means you are offering it to that kind of vast pool of creativity and, um, and resources that exist outside of copyright law. Okay, um, I think we have time for one more question. So if, if it's all right with you all, I, I wanted to just kind of zoom out a little bit. I understand that um, Shalini, you're um, the Kabbalaharia, and I'm mispronouncing it, I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, that's been around for 20 years now. I know the conversation's been around since uh, I think you said 2006, Joel. So I'm curious what some of the main learning. 2011. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Thanks. I think. Um, I'm I'm curious what some of the main learnings and and insights are that you've you've seen over time kind of emerge in in both of your organizations and also any learnings that you've had from um, from me, Dan, as well. So yeah. Shalini, I'll, I might field this to you first and then to Joel. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think that um, when we started Kabbalaharia in 2002, uh, the context in uh, North India was one where um, uh, there was media that was present in rural areas uh, but this this was in the form of newspapers that were being produced in urban centers for rural audiences. The content of those newspapers was quite distant from the realities of rural audiences. So news was mostly from urban areas, um, focusing on rural areas only when there were large events, but not on a regular basis. Um, the content was also in a language that was... Um, distant to audiences in rural areas. Um, and finally, the content was almost uh, always produced by uh, male reporters um, who were living outside these rural areas. Um, we started Kabbalaria in, in that context, and we decided to train uh, local women, rural women, to produce a newspaper that would focus on local news. Um, the everyday issues of local people, news that never made it to um, mainstream media or to bigger newspapers at that time. Um, news that was also in the local language um, and was available to uh, readers uh, very easily. Um, so that I think has been an important learning for us um, for, for all these years that uh, investing in local news, um, investing in training uh, local women or rural women to work as journalists, uh, women who understand the context, um, the issues in a very in-depth manner, uh, who probably need some training in um, producing the news, uh, but uh, you know their, their perspective really matters. And that perspective is something uh, that we've always valued in Kabbalaria. So there are three core values of Kabbalaria that um, the newsroom is local, it's independent, and it's feminist. Um, and in all the 20 years, these three core values have only been strengthened um, in all the work that Kabbalaria has done. So the team has grown. Uh, its presence as a local newsroom has become stronger. Um, and also its feminist perspective is still very distinct from all the other news that's being produced uh, in that area. So I think uh, for me, an important learning is um, investing in local news, local women, 
um, adapting to the changing media and digital landscape. Um, I, as I said earlier, Caballeria started as a newspaper, um, moved to being a digital news service in 2015-16, um, expanded its reach after becoming digital. So we adapted very quickly because the media landscape was changing so rapidly at that time. Um, also, I think in terms of uh, sources of revenue, um, you know, starting as a nonprofit, realizing that funding cannot always sustain a newspaper or a newsroom, um, looking for different sources of revenue, trying to identify what can be those sources um, and trying to sustain the newsroom has been challenging. But I think not depending on one source of income or funding is again an important uh, insight. Um, and uh, you know, for any newsroom, I think uh, it's a valuable insight. Thank you for that. And Joel? I mean, I think one of the lessons that I take away is that complex issues require complex answers and and there needs to be space in the media for journalism that addresses that and and there are, is all too little of it um but again the, the creative commons license lets us get it out there to more people and you know and and i think the growth of the conversation over the last decade um, has really shown that there, there's an audience for it. Um, there's sadly also an audience for misinformation, but um, I think there, there are a lot of inspiring efforts going on around the world to work on these challenges, and, uh, and we're glad to be, uh, be part of that. Thank you both so much. And it's it's great to hear the the lessons that you've been learning along the way. I'm sure they they resonate with a lot of us, not just in um, in newsrooms, but also um, in in other spaces as well. So thank you for sharing both of those. Um, it's been an absolute honor to have the chance to to speak with both of you and ask you questions. We are unfortunately now out of out, out of time, so I think we have to to end this webinar here. But I hope the the conversations can continue. Feel free to. Um, type your your comments and questions in the chat space right now and um, look back we'll we'll see what we can drum up next and I hope to see many of you at our um, our free online training on March 23rd. Thank you all so much.